So when I first got into real estate, the gentleman who kind of told me to get into real estate, I was helping him on the IT side, actually. And he let his license go. He was an investor. That was his main business. And he just said, you need to make it your priority to invest in real estate as soon as you, you know, safely can. He says, never over leverage. He's always very smart and stable. However, I knew I need to purchase property as quickly as I can safely. Um, so that was my goal. Um, just about a year after I got my license, I purchased my first um, investment property. And I think that's the fun part is purchasing an investment property before your primary is easier because I don't care about the neighborhood. I don't need to live there. I don't right. care if the <laughs> carpet is ugly. I don't need to see it. So I was able to make decisions based on what I thought the perfect investment was. And I was able to walk the walk. And I tell my clients, I actively invest in real estate. So Welcome to the Hassle-Free RE Podcast, a real estate podcast where we bring you stories, education, and tips for investors and real estate enthusiasts. If you're interested in investing in real estate or just want to keep a pulse on what's happening in the market, then this podcast is for you. Thanks so much for listening and tuning in. If you enjoy our show, please make sure to subscribe and give us a five-star review. We'd greatly appreciate it. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Hassle-Free RE Podcast. I am your host, Dave Menapace, and I'm joined here by my co-host, Kim Menapace. And today we have a very special guest. His name is Will Van Wickler, and Will is a real estate agent. He's also a real estate investor. He operates uh, in the northeast corner of the U.S. up in Maine. And Will will tell his story, but I'll share kind of how we met. Uh, will is an admin in a Facebook group that I'm very active in up in the Sunday River of Maine. And, uh, you know, folks are always sort of asking, how can I, uh, who's a good agent in the area? And I knew a few and, and I would throw their names out. And one day Will just simply asked me, hey, how can I get your referral? And that for me, uh, that got me energized. That question got me going. And I was really excited to meet Will after that. And, you know, if you've been listening to our, our series of podcasts here, you'll know that I'm one of those people that believes if you want something, you got to ask for it. And so that was really the start of a really great relationship that Will and I have, Will, Kim and I have. And, uh, so if you want something, ask for it. A little lesson for you. Uh, so with that, Will, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell the listeners sort of where you live, but more broadly where you operate. And we'll just kind of get right in it from the beginning of your real estate story. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the intro, Dave. And uh, covered it pretty well. Will Van Wickler with <laughs> Keller Williams Realty in Maine. So Maine is a pretty large territory. So I split my time personally between Falmouth, Maine on the coast, and then New Remain, which is the mountains region, which really allows me to have a large uh, demographic covering a pretty substantial area in the state. So helping buyers and sellers throughout that area, and then also invest myself. Um, got in the business right after high school, 18 years old, knowing nothing and knowing nobody, and really just took <laughs> the ground running and uh, dove in head first, all in, and here we are today. <laughs> I love it. What now when going back to then, so you graduated high school, like what was it that you were like, this is the industry that I want to dive into? What's so funny nowadays, I think is kids in high school and even younger are getting involved in, you know, the bigger pockets and we have access to the podcast. I met with a mortgage loan officer yesterday. He said his kid has a custodial fidelity account at 15 years old and is investing <laughs> in his IRA, which I think is hilarious. And yeah. I really just saw it as um, real estate as a vehicle to get me to where I want to be, researching all these really high net worth individuals that are making a big impact and live a big life and are able to help people have a tie to real estate, whether they got in through the brokerage of it or holding it. I just right. saw it. it's a way for me to work as hard as I want, go all in with something and really make an income where I can you know, meet my goals. So. Yeah. That is awesome. Yeah. When I was 21, I was trying to figure out how we were going to, you know, throw a rocking 21st birthday party <laughs> for my roommates. And that'll be, the, that's not appropriate for this podcast, but um, 
Yeah, I was a really, really, really long way away from even caring about making money. We'll put it that way. Um, or working for that matter. Um, and and so did you grow up in the state of Maine? You're, are you a, a Maine native? Sixth generation, I just found out. Right. So it goes <laughs> very far back. Yeah, born and raised in Falmouth, which is kind of funny. People always say, you must get so much business from your sphere of influence, as we call it in the business. And I joke, yeah. my sphere of influence they're partying up at Umaine Arno in Bangor. So um, not too helpful right now, but born and raised in the area, which gives me kind of a unique um, overview. I know the schools really well. I know the places right. that you want to live, that you don't want to live. I know what roads are busy in the summer, which ones right. aren't. So it gives me that unique approach that not a lot of agents have. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Um so, uh, so did you always, you know, being, being an agent, did you kind of always know I want to attack, you know, these markets in Maine? Cause I'm sure if something good came across, you'd take other markets or did you kind of just really start locally in Falmouth and then kind of expand? How did, how did you kind of get your eyes set on Newry? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think as agents, it, we evolve and we start to figure out our business, at least myself, um, Dave, you're very intentional. So maybe it seems like you're very niche to start. I think a lot right. of people start big and then they focus. Um, I started out, which I really recommend if you're young and you don't have a big sphere of influence, join a team, meet with a mm. team leader that is doing a ton of business. And I tell people, it's like you're going to college. It's an internship. You're probably not going to make a ton of money, um, but you're doing a lot of deals fast and it's a high floor, low ceiling is what I say. So you're going to max right. out quick, but you're going to do a ton of deals. So I got my real estate MBA, five years of education in one year, doing a ton of deals hyper locally in Falmouth. So not a lot of my own deals. I mean, I got credit for them. I got paid on them. Um, but from the rainmaker, as they're called right. in Keller Williams vernacular um, yeah. through here, I quickly learned in the market we were in the turn and burn model of brokerage where, you know, buyer focused, very buyer heavy. Uh, you want to go see a house? Let's go now. Let's do this now. Let's do, I'll write the offer, 10 offers to get a buyer under contract. You know, I love working with people, but it really wasn't the fiduciary local expert experience I was aiming for. So once I had the confidence to go out on my own, my right. business transitioned greatly into being a market specialist that is focused on what I know. And if I don't know it, I'll be the first to tell you, and I will put you in touch with somebody that knows it better and refer right. that business out. So that's my focus now. Start big right. and then become the specialist. Yeah. Yeah. What is really neat about that too is like, like I totally agree, um, especially in the joining the team part, you know, especially if you really need to start generating some income, right? If you don't really have a good year to get a runway under you. And by a good year, that means like working full time for a full year. That's not yeah. like chilling, it's telling people you're a real estate agent, but yeah. joining, you know, joining a team, that's where you're going to get all of the technical experience. And the other thing is, you know, I, I liked how you, um, I like how you articulated it uh, with like the, the sort of real estate MBA rate, right? right? Because you're going to be, when you are involved and around that many transactions, you are going to start to see a lot of different things pop up. You're going to get so much experience that you can then take into your own business. Not only that, <clears throat> but you're learning the whole lead generation side of things as well. Um, so was it, you know, so it's kind of interesting. So you have you had two very similar to me in Massachusetts, right? Where I have <clears throat> helping people with like the primary home situation, but also helping people with the secondary or, investment property situation and, and each, you know, I know that you're in Portland a lot too. So it's like all these have, uh, different flavors. What, um, and I don't want to like pigeonhole you, but, um, what kind of, uh, which of those models do you tend to gravitate to, or is it sort of equal amongst all of them, you know, vacation, primary mix of both? What's interesting in our market versus I talk to a lot of agents all over the country. I love to network and see what other people are doing. And for instance, like in Breckenridge, Colorado, there's enough business there to sustain a full-time income and for people to meet their goals. 
in Maine, we are still a much smaller market. Um, I'm having a conversation next week with an agent in the Hamptons who did $220 million in volume, 50 deals last year. <laughs> so, I mean, crazy numbers for me to do my 15 million in volume or 10 million in volume, I need to split it up and get a little bit bigger. So the goal is at some point, you know, to grow the team that I can service all these areas, but I can focus on one because I love yeah. the vacation market. I think it's so right. dynamic. It has its challenges. Um, and we get to help people achieve their goals in a place that they love, which is yeah. really cool. But at this point in the market in Maine, it's interesting and it's growing rapidly. I know we were just talking uh, off air about the prices have like tripled. So <laughs> yeah. it's becoming more obtainable. But right now, right. Um, with you know my market share, there's just not quite enough business um, in either market. So I got to kind of combine, which is great. And um, yeah. the seasonality is kind of cool too. Um, right. People people think I'm this genius for timing this out, but <laughs> the winters are usually pretty busy up at the mountain and yeah. real estate is pretty slow this time of year uh, for primary um, yeah. home buyers and sellers. So it's kind of cool. Totally. In the summer, I get to take a few trips up to Western Maine. I have a place up there, so that's helpful. Yeah, but there's really not too much going on. And then in the summer, it's uh, right. game on in Greater Portland. I love it, uh, Kim. Any thoughts? Um, going back to the vol the volume of transactions in your first experience, I think that what helps with that is I that there's rarely a happy path for closings. And I think Dave's learned that with some of his transactions last year. And uh, I remember friends saying. I don't really know why I used an agent or I've never heard of a bad closing. Mine was really smooth and uneventful. So I imagine you saw a lot of crazy stuff and that just that experience helps you guide first time home buyers or people who only buy a couple houses in their lifetime uh, through those those tough times. So that's what I was thinking. I don't know if you have any stories from from that that were me meaning or memorable for you. <laughs> Yeah. So like a really good friend and mentor, he wasn't who I was on his a team with, but, you know, he kind of jokes with people. He did, you know, 325 transactions last year. And he's telling me he's recruiting somebody. He says, if you just sit in the room with me and listen to these calls, you're technically getting access to over 150 transactions that I'm just doing. So for me, it was this kid that baby face knows nothing, zero confidence. I was able to talk in a way that not like a poser, like I did all these deals, but right. I could walk the walk because I was a part of these situations. Every appointment I could shadow, I went there and shadowed. And I think the big thing about getting in young, to your, what you're saying, Kim, is you could listen. I didn't need to make a lot of money. I was doing some freelance right. IT work on the side, making, I mean, a right. really good income for an 18, 19 year old <laughs> uh, doing the freelance work. I was still going to college part-time. So I had all the time in the world and I didn't really need to make a ton of money because of ancillary, you know, opportunities I was in. So every opportunity I could shadow, every conversation, I was in the office every single day, even if I didn't have anything going on, I would just sit there and listen um, and take advice and take every opportunity, even if it was a terrible opportunity. I've got to drive somewhere I don't want to drive and go show a mobile, you know. $30,000. Yeah. <laughs> I am losing money. I did everything. And I'm so grateful um, just for the opportunity and listening. And that's really what catapulted my success, I believe. And I have a lot of room for growth, but I could walk the walk. I knew the conversations. I heard these incredibly tough conversations that people were having, um, the scripts to use. And I knew all the objections before they even happened, which was huge. Yeah. And yeah. to to go on to that, how many years have you been in real estate full-time now? Full-time has been two years. Yeah, a little okay, over two. Yeah, still, still so early in your career. It's phenomenal. Yeah. I think when we looked at your LinkedIn and saw the year you graduated, we, our minds were blown. <laughs> it was only a couple yeah. of years ago. And uh, yeah, I can give you the platform to humble brag right now. I think we saw Thank something you. about top... Uh, in Keller Williams, there was some um, notoriety you guys got for for your particular um, your achievements. I didn't know if it was your team or you particular, but I'll let you take the platform and tell us. <laughs> yeah, and it's something I'm trying to get better at because <laughs> I I mean, growing up, my personality, I'm sure you've seen like the DISC uh, personality yeah. or the KPA, the Keller personality. Like yeah. I was always in the shadows. I didn't want the trophies. I didn't like the big birthday parties. So now, <laughs> you know, I think confidence in real estate is such a big thing. And now I, you know, believe in what I'm saying. So 
putting that notoriety stuff out there. I wouldn't have done that two years ago. Now I'm like, okay, you got to right. get excited. So um, the team, I did have a VA. Uh, it wasn't quite the right fit. So I'm working on shuffling someone in now, but that's the extent of it. It's just me and leverage. Um, so for the past, I think six months, we've ranked in the top five agents for all of Keller Williams, New England, which has just been awesome. like incredibly humbling because um, yeah. there's almost 6,500 licensees in New England. So it's really been um, an honor to be up at the top with these people. And uh, we just got to keep it going. That's what I keep saying. Let's just keep it going. And I don't ever let it get to my head. And I'm just incredibly <laughs> grateful for the opportunity and the recognition. But it's been, um, yeah, it's been a blast. And I went out officially on my own in April. So going into Q2 with nothing on my plate, no business, no systems, no models, and just put my head down and uh, hit the phones and we were able to pull it together for some strong momentum. Oh, that's phenomenal. Oh, that's Thank very you. cool to, to see that. And I, I think that I want to dig into the investing side now, because I think that's another part of um, success that we've seen with you is when we're talking about long-term rentals and short-term rentals, because we were touring um, one of the uh, ski on ski off condos that will had listed. And then we got to talking and really realizing you were an investor yourself and owned your own properties as well. So I want to go into that and give us the lay of the land of what you, you currently own. Yeah. So when I first got into real estate, the gentleman who kind of told me to get into real estate, I was helping him on the IT side, actually. And he let his license go. He was an investor. That was his main business. And he just said, you need to make it your priority to invest in real estate as soon as you, you know, safely can. He says, never over leverage. Is always very smart and stable. However, I knew I need to purchase property as quickly as I can safely. Um, so that was my goal. Um, just about a year after I got my license, I purchased my first um, investment property. And I think that's the fun part is purchasing an investment property before your primary is easier because I don't care about the neighborhood. I don't need to live there. I don't right. care if the <laughs> carpet is ugly. I don't need to see it. So I was able to make decisions based on what I thought the perfect investment was. And I was able to walk the walk and I tell my clients, I actively invest in real estate. So uh, I purchased my first STR December of last year. I picked up a long-term rental um, in the summer. And then I've got another short-term rental that I picked up this summer as well. Um, and then I've got a couple, couple flips here and there and um, other things we're working on. And I'm on the hunt for another property right now. So really just growing the portfolio, slow and steady wins the race and uh, just make an informed decision. So I purchased a place up at the mountain. It's where I grew up skiing Sunday river. And I really saw that as such a great opportunity. One as an awesome hedge against inflation with what the mountains doing up there It was during COVID and um, all these deals that I do are very creative. So, and we can talk about that. I'll let you guys lead, but that's kind of where I'm at right now. I've got the short, two short-term rentals and a uh, long-term rental as well, which my game plan is to, sell at some point in 1031 exchange into another short-term rental. I prefer the model. Chess pieces, chess pieces for a bigger game. Exactly. What, what I love, you know, what I think is really inspiring about your story is uh, your ability to do two things. Say yes, say yes to things and to focus at the same time, because, you know, I, um, like for me, when I left healthcare and went into real estate full time, similar to you, I made sure I was always available to say yes. You know, and and Kim had to a lot of times do double time with the kids, and I had to say no to, you know, golf tournaments that I've done for like fifteen years. <clears throat> when I started saying yes to more things that were in line with my focused goal, I did have to start saying no to other things. But at the same time. <clears throat> Had I not done that, I'd be back at a job that I really wasn't enjoying. It was a good job. I just didn't enjoy it anymore. So um, I, I, and it's, what's great too, is when you are younger, you know, before you have the family, before you have kids, before you have a bunch of responsibilities that life inevitably throws at you, if you can take a commission based job that is directly tied to your expertise and your skill set and work at it every day as if you were showing up to an office, you know, pick six days of the week and make sure you take one day off if you can. But if you do that every single day, 
even if your first year is really light and not a lot of traction, like you're gonna start to get a lot more momentum. Right. And of course you can, you can speed through some of those areas where you don't get traction by joining a team and things of that nature. But, you know, if you take as much opportunity to kind of invest in your education and invest in yourself and investing your time more than anything, you're absolutely going to get results, whether it's just being an investor, being an agent, a lot of times the two can go hand in hand really nicely. Um, so that's my two cents on that. It's like, I think I a lot of people lot. get ready to get ready. And I think that's the thing is sometimes you just got to do it and it's easier said than done, but I had no responsibilities. I had no income for requirements. Yeah. So I was able to go all in, which is such a blessing. And um, <laughs> even harder, you know, going from healthcare, you've got the family, you've got the marriage respect to you because it's a lot harder to do what <laughs> you did. And I'm not sure I would have had the courage. I told myself, I'm going to get into this. <laughs> now is the only time I'm going to do yeah. this. I'm very conservative um, with my investing and risk. I'm very risk tolerant. So yeah, I respect you, what you guys have done. It's awesome. It's definitely well, probably, yeah. I would not recommend doing this in your early thirties <laughs> for, for perspective. Our, I, I wish I should say, I wish we used our twenties differently in this vein, but also I think everything was a lesson and I don't regret anything. It's just, it's funny. Now we're really, we hit the ground running with our first short-term rental when we were 30 and now it's we're just we're snowballing from there. But, uh, in the last week we had one or both of our kids homesick for four of the last work days. So, so <laughs> try and so that, and that's for, you know, for this stuff, for Dave, for my W2, uh, it, trying to keep everything afloat with children. You're trying to keep alive and not letting them, you know, fall off the couch and hit their head on the coffee table type of stuff while they're, they're also not feeling well with the fever. So, uh, kudos to you for having that foresight to double down and invest that time in your twenties. I'd say for anyone in Thank their twenties, please take advantage of it. Dave and I had a lot of fun. We, you know, liked our jobs then, but we do look back and in hindsight, wish we read certain books and listened to certain content and podcasts and stuff and, and started get, taking a crack at this much earlier. Cause it, it just, uh, snowballs and, and uh, you have that compound interest effect on your investing career, on your wealth and, and all that. And we're just playing catch up now and it's not a great time with a one-year-old and three-year-old, but there's no time <laughs> like the present. I think well, the truth yeah. is too, like myself and you all, even though, I mean, you said you feel behind, which I think is false. <laughs> we are always our worst critics. It's like, somebody said to me early on, I'm always like, I could do more, I could do more. He's like, well, you can afford to mess up 10 times and you'll still be okay. I mean, say, like you guys are already so far ahead of what other people are doing. They're in their 50s thinking, oh, gosh, I should invest in real estate. Um, time is the most valuable asset I've learned. It's like we all have time yeah. to mess up and hit the road bumps and slow and grow again. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. I would say we didn't even get into real estate until after we bought our second house, like our vacation house. It was really, you know, and we talk about it in other shows, but you know, it was like, we bought the house. We sort of took a crack on at it with Airbnb, which was pretty, it's like not hard, especially back in 2019. And then, you know, a few months after we bought that house, that was when we listened to rich or red rich dad, poor dad. That was when we actually got interested <laughs> in what we Classic. were doing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it, it, and, and it's really, actually, it's really neat now, four years later, coming up on four years, reflecting on that, like we have come light years since then, but to your point, you know, had we not taken action, had we not done that? And then had we not continued to just put one foot in front of the other every single day? I mean, there's a lot to appreciate when you look back on all that stuff. So, um, yeah, there, there it's neat. There's a lot there. I want to um, talk real quick. You kind of dropped dropped some knowledge a little bit on some of the creative stuff. Was that like in terms of investing? Was that sort of like with the financing? Was it with the acquisition, or is it how you kind of currently manage it? Kind of all of the above. What I'll note is I don't intend to be the biggest, and I don't think I need to be. Um, just like you all, and we've talked about is. You don't have to be the biggest. If you run highly profitable um, properties, you only need a couple. Uh, the operating principal of the Keller Williams office, she was in the book, The Millionaire Real Estate Investor. And 
Yeah. I remember I asked her, how many properties do you have? And she's like, I only have seven, seven long-term rentals. A lot of times you don't need a ton. So I think that's mm -hmm. kind of cool. And I led with what are the smallest bites I can take off that are going to be the highest return um, yeah. for my money. So pretty much every property except for one, I've purchased off the multiple listing service, mm -hmm. um, reaching out direct to sellers. So this is also something I tell buyers as my value proposition. Um, I actively prospect every single day, um, buyers for my sellers or sellers for my buyers, vice versa. So reaching out to sellers, the first property, direct mail campaign, got a hit immediately. The seller did not want to work with a broker. He did pay me a commission. However, he wanted to save. This is a lesson why not to go for sale by owner because I picked up my first property for 260000 I sold the actually a worse unit Two months later, for three hundred and sixty thousand cash, um, <laughs> really didn't even hit the market. Would have gone for more. So, hundred thousand dollars in instant equity. Um, yeah. I got to do some things you wouldn't have been able to do on market, like you know, long inspection windows, long app times for mortgage. Got locked in at three percent back in those days, um, right. and worked with a local bank that really had some quality products um, and was able to work with me on the acquisition of that. So that was a really cool one off market flexible timelines, all that good stuff and got in right before the ski season. Yeah. So that was sweet. Um, oh, that's awesome. Hit the ground running there, which was awesome. And then the place, <laughs> uh, the long-term rental was a call-in I got, a lady that uh, my team leader helped, did a market analysis for like 10 years ago. She's like, I need someone to help lease my place out. Like I make no money in Maine on leasing. We charge a month's rent. I got to yeah. pay my photographer $500. And then my it's like, I'm losing money, but saying yes to opportunity, nurturing a relationship, helped her find a tenant in there. House was terrible from the sixties, never updated so many problems. She would have had to put $50,000 into it. I said, all right, here are your options. I know you like the cash flow, but there are problems with the house. We can sell it. Here's what your capital gain is going to be. Here's the fair market price. And then here's what I'm willing to do. I'm willing to be the purchaser. You can be the bank. Um, and it was attractive oh. for her. So owner financed that one with I'll tell you $10,000 down. I ran the profit and loss yesterday, the spreadsheet. I put $7,000 in to fix it up, renting it out for 3,500 a month now. Um, and my pay monthly payments like $1,500. So had a broker price opinion right. done at 652. So crazy equity, but yeah. the house needed a lot of work. I spent all summer nights and weekends over there doing the floors, doing the walls. So that was owner financed value add. And then the other one was on multiple listing service. They listed it at kind of a weird time. It was on the lake, Belgrade Lakes region, which was yeah. another kind of niche market I cover. And just the timing was strange. It was kind of when the market was shifting a little bit. They listed during a weekend where it was Memorial Day weekend, but people weren't focused on real estate. And I swooped in, they did a small price reduction. It went multiple <laughs> offers again. But they liked my address. Yeah. <laughs> it said Maine. Um, and all the other right. offers were out of state. So I kind of count my lucky stars. I said, you know what? I'll waive my inspection. Uh, here's my financing. It's a local bank. I said, I'm a local agent. And I can get this to the closing table, which they wanted that security. Right. And oftentimes, it's selling yourself as the buyer and not doing a sappy love letter, but really doing a letter that's like, I know the lakes. I grew up here. My grandmother grew up on the lake. Right. Here's my lender. You can call her. We're going to get this to the closing table. So that one picked up for 268, appraised for 345, and then gutted it down to the studs. I got to get another uh, opinion done, but I think I'm probably in the 450s there and only invested 10,000. So everything I do, very value add. I like paint and paper renovations where I can add value. Right now, myself, I'm young. I've got the time. I don't mind doing the manual labor. I kind of <laughs> like it. Um, but things where I joke with people, if my gross commission off the property, that should be enough to cover the renovation. So I like high value that. add, location, location, location is really my criteria. Oh man, that's awesome. I I want to, like, that's really awesome, actually. I shouldn't glance over that. That's really fantastic. Um, Thank you. Let's uh, real quick go back. You know, what I love about that seller finance uh, situation that you had is, you brought value to a ton of people in one transaction. So somebody might sit here and say, why in the world would she do seller finance? Why wouldn't she just take her cash and run, right? 
turns out I'm guessing she probably wanted a monthly paycheck, but didn't want to have to do the work that it takes to maintain and deal with the house anymore. You were her solution to that. She probably also didn't want to necessarily like pay a big commission to someone for the transaction. Once again, you were the solution to that, right? So it's like now she's getting a monthly payment for however long the duration of the note is. Uh, it was really a, probably a very cost-effective transaction for her that was probably fairly painless because again, you were the solution to her. And then on the flip side, you took a space, you made it even nicer for tenants, right? In, in Portland, there's Portland, Maine, right? Was it South Portland? Portland. South yep. Portland, right. So again, another area that I know there's restrictions around short-term rentals, but, Unfortunately, you, know, yeah. you, but you, you kept it as a long-term rental, which does help out the local population. Like you brought value to everyone and, and who also got value out of it? You did, right? Like you did. And had you not said yes. And had you not gone in there and had you not gotten your hands, I shouldn't say hands dirty, but like, had you not gotten involved with that person in that transaction, that property that is now yours would have never happened, you know? And I think that a lot of times, especially folks that are just early in their real estate career, it doesn't matter what their age is. I think that the ones that are not quite as successful, or I should say not successful in achieving their goals are the ones that aren't thinking about things creatively, right? Re I should say creatively and realistically. You can't take a, you can't apply all these things to like a new build or something of that nature, yeah. but um, you know what I mean? And on top of that, you had the mentorship in a lot of different angles, whether it was within your brokerage or outside your brokerage, like you didn't go at it alone. You put yourself in a room with people that, you know, you learned about creative financing, seller financing from somewhere because you put yourself in a position to learn it. And I just, I think that's the lesson here with both that house and the, uh, the Belgrade house as well, Belgrade. So um, I love that. <laughs> Thank you. I think the other thing I learned is have tools in your toolbox. I always give people options. And I think some things can get sketchy as like, oh, I just wholesaled this house off of this little old lady and flipped it for 500. That like you're taking advantage of people. Um, I right. tell people like I'm a fiduciary to a fault. I only do what's best for people. And I lose business because of that sometimes, but it's okay with me. I'm in it for the long haul. Um, right. But have options for people. Don't just say, hey, we could sell it for this and that's great. Take time to listen and internalize the problems they're having and then come up with creative solutions, um, which is kind of my value proposition. It's, you know, listen, think, here are four options that we can do. And really, yeah. we just need to figure out what's best for you. That's a super powerful statement. And I think that that is what separates um, your run at, you know, you from the other 6,500, you know, like in, in realtors in, in all seriousness, it, that that mentality and that approach and not going into something like you need that transaction, but you're just trying to give them value. Just them learning those four or five different options is value to them and letting them come up with what they want to do or circle back to ask your opinion. That's how you really get that sort of like referral based business and grow your business and get the types of sales that you've seen in two to three years. You know what I mean? It's uh for anyone that's a real estate agent, these are some really like powerful and also very manageable tips to, to kind of operate your business by. Yeah. I want to cultivate raving fans. That's what I say to people is that's my goal is cultivate raving fans <laughs> for life. When people think real estate, I want them to stop traffic and say, you got to talk to Will. He really helped me on this situation. Even if I didn't help them sell, I had an appointment yesterday. I just went to meet with somebody uh, to see if I could help them understand their situation. And you know, I didn't make anything off that. It was two hours out of my right. day, but that's what makes me tick. And that's why I do what I do is I get to help people. And if it turns into something great, but if not, you know, hopefully they say something good about me and pass my name right. along. Yeah. yeah. It's someone that we really uh, admire in the short-term rental space is Bill Faith and his philosophy yeah. is give, 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 give. And maybe it'll turn into business and maybe not, but be, you just want to have this giving attitude. And that's something we like to do. And part of the reason we do this podcast, we enjoy it a lot. And we just like bringing this content and bringing fabulous people like you to, <laughs> to, to other a different audience. That's what sets you guys apart too, I believe is, 
you know, all these consultants, I think they sit at such a high level and they think they're the best. They are the best, whatever. You guys are very humble, even though I told someone yesterday, I'm like, these people are like the smartest people I know. They know more than anyone. But you guys are very humble about it and you're willing to share, which I think is so awesome. And um, that's why you guys are just going to explode with the co-hosting because you you help people. And if right. business comes from it, great. But you don't lead with that. You just help people. Right. I like to approach it with a really honest and transparent uh, take to these things. Cause I think people can glamorize everything. Everything's always going well. And I think, uh, you know, we, we like to approach life with gratitude and, and try to look at <laughs> the glasses being half full, but we also like to share the tough times and the, the funny moments and the, the missteps we have too. And I think that's part of what helps keep us humble is remembering those yeah. things and, and being honest with ourselves there. Sorry, Dave, I, I think you were going to add something too. <laughs> no, you know, what I was going to say is yeah, uh, everyone's motivations are, are different, like in, in, in life. Right. And what I've come to learn is like what I truly enjoy doing, and this is going to sound insane, but I truly enjoy spending an hour crafting an email or some type of document that walks somebody through my thoughts on a particular property. I like spending an hour that way. It gets me going. It energizes me. For other people, it doesn't. And that's okay too. We all have different motivations, right? Um, so it just kind of aligns really nicely because I could sit there and pump out, you know, seven analysis reports like that in a day. And I, it energizes me because I like doing the research. I like getting in there and then I like applying it and seeing what the results are going to be. Um, so that it, that's why I think this business works well, at least for me anyways. Um, so let's, let's kind of take this, let's start looking forward now, right? So you've been doing, you know, some amazing work, both as an agent, as an investor, as just like a steward of the industry, where would you like to, you know, what are some of your goals in both of those spheres or only one, however you want to take it, what are some of your goals in 2023? And, you know, then like looking forward, say it's 2027, you know, what would make you look backwards and be like, these were a fantastic seven years that I've spent. Yeah. I think about this all the time is like my GPS, right? Like, where am I going <laughs> yeah. and how do I get there? So for me, it's just being steady and continue, continuing what I'm doing and not get off course. Uh, I see a lot of people, they get success early on and then it's, you know, the roller coaster ride and I'm very steady and I like to be that way. So for me, it's the first two years of real estate are like the worst years. People say the first five years are the hardest years. So it's get past the five with just steady growth and continuing what I'm doing and following my mission, uh, vision and values um, with, you know, hopefully another real estate acquisition. However, it's more, I'm more focused on, you know, the impact I can make and continuing to help people. And, you know, with that growth comes, by 2027, my goal is not to be super big. I would love to have a small, very powerful team. Um, I look to agents, you know, like that gentleman in the Hamptons, he's got an executive assistant and somebody that helps him with some buyers, um, which is just leverage by that time, you know, probably have some more obligations, you know, <laughs> marriage thing happens, maybe, who knows, but uh, just really leverage and um, leveraging right. my time, I think, Somebody said to me, they're like, I can't wait until you see the value in paying people to do the stuff you're doing right now. Like, you know, in South Portland, Maine, painting the ceiling at 2 a.m. And I have a listing appointment at 9 a.m. Like, what am I doing here? But really starting to there. leverage my time. Yep. And, uh, you know, really become the local expert and grow the brand even more. So having the local specialists that believe in the vision I have and, you know, love to have my small Newry based team and my small greater Portland based team to assist me. Yeah, dude, I think, I think that's fantastic. And to get, you know, a little bit more, uh, not granular, I should say tactical, because I know that some of the folks listening to this are going to be really thinking about making a career change into being an agent, probably specifically, what are some of the, and, and you don't have to go too deep, but so it's April of this year or, or of last year, I'm sorry. Uh, you've now broken off from the team. What are maybe a couple 
you know, very simple action steps or yeah, processes or what have you that folks can do to maybe start being able to drum up business uh, for themselves if, if they're just getting into the industry. Yeah. Uh, so I'll tell you like what I did transitioning up a team. I just wrote everything that had to happen and that the team was were doing for me. Um, everybody's always freaking out. Like I need logos. I need cards. I need like, I can take care of all that. I need to go get business. Lead generation is the number one priority in your day. And I'll just say like, Quickly, the job description of a real estate agent is you lead generate, you go on appointments, you negotiate contracts, you practice scripts and role play, and you go to closings. Nothing else matters. Um, right. So it's lead generation. If you have a big sphere, don't be a secret agent. Tell people you're a real estate agent. But come from contribution. I've learned when I ask for business, you got to remind people a lot. You know, if you know anybody at work, school, church, whatever. If they need an agent, would you think of me? Or like my CPA, he sends business to a different agent. But I said, Pete, if there's somebody that might not be a good fit for this agent, just keep me in mind. I'd love to be your right. backup plan, your, your bench warmer. Yeah. Um, so it's asking for business and being consistent. What I learned is like, if you're consistent in other parts of your life, people will realize that, you know, go to CrossFit every single day at 5 a.m., never miss a day. Started to get business from that because people saw, right. wow, Will's consistent in this and he shows up. Um, and that resulted in my business. So it's lead generation. I didn't know a lot of people. So I pounded the phones, calling the expired listings for sale by owners, um, lead generating through social media groups, referral partners out of state, pulling the lists of where the zip codes are coming from the feeder markets, calling those agents and getting referral partnerships with them. Um, really those are kind of the things that got me started. And now I've been able to create more of a sphere based referral business and leveraging social media, I think has been huge for me is doing the videos and just adding value to people. Uh, if they need a surveyor, if they need, you know, pressure washer person, somebody joked with me, they're like, if somebody reaches out to you and needs a pressure washer, you go rent the pressure washer form and tell them it's a courtesy of your business. It's like, you need to be the go-to for information and business will follow up. So lead generate, don't just sit and wait for the business to come. Because right. when you're starting out, you really can't unless you are the connector and everybody knows. So, yeah, I think those are all really amazing, really uh, powerful tactical steps, too. And I think each and every one of them is so incredibly important. And it's like my suggestion to people, especially if you're starting or <clears throat> if you're looking to make a transi it, transition into being a real estate salesperson is to start doing these things in your free time. And if you don't have free time, create free time, sleep less, you'll, you'll survive. It'll be okay. But start doing these lead generation steps as soon as you possibly can. I mean, heck you can be studying to get your real estate license, like start the conversation, tell everyone that, you know, what you're doing, Continue to put yourself in a room where you're getting education because you're around the right people, whether it's meetups, masterminds, courses, whatever it might be. I mean, the Facebook groups are the best, to be honest with you. The, yeah. We get a lot of business right through the Facebook groups, this podcast, which was not intended to bring in leads, but it's, it's helping people and they reach back out. And then I get to go have lunch with someone and talk to them about real estate. My second favorite thing to do, you know, after, after doing an analysis on a house, I really should say they're both my favorite, but when you um, come from contribution, amazing things happen. <laughs> and I'm like an yeah. introvert. I'm not a huge people person. But that's what's great about this business is we get to connect about what we love and it's a bridge. So yes. that's my motivation for other people that are like, I'm not the connector in town. I don't know all these people. You can still do it. It's just different. I Absolutely. love that because Dave's the extrovert in our relationship and I'm the extrovert. <laughs> oh, we go to coffee. Hey, that's the local coffee shop and everyone knows him and someone from our daycare, someone from the CrossFit gym. So <laughs> everyone knows Dave will spend three hours there in the morning and run into a dozen people he knows. So. Yep. I love it's it. I'll just getting, get like, get my coffee, then go to the back of the line for the next one. <laughs> That's your lead gen. Hey, I know my audience, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so with that, uh, we're, we're going to wrap this up here. Will, can you share with people how they can reach out to you if they're either looking to learn more and, and learn to follow in your footsteps or if they want to buy really anywhere, buy a home anywhere in Maine, how can they reach out to you? Yeah, call or text. I 
pride myself on being available whenever needed. 207-232-8877. You can find me on Instagram. Um, just search my name, Will, V-A-N-W-I-C-K-L-E-R. It's my website as well. Um, SundayRiverSold.com is another website we have. So here to help really anybody with anything. Um, I had a call yesterday, somebody just thinking about moving to Maine, telling them about the area. So if you want to get into real Love estate, it. get connected with somebody. Um, look to me as your partner for anything Maine. Love it. And we'll take all of that information and put it right into the show notes uh, Thank both you. for the podcast as well as the YouTube recording of this. Um, so Will, thank you, man. We really, really appreciated having you on the show. And uh, with that, till next time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dave. This was a blast. Thanks, Kim. Yeah, thank you, Will. This podcast is brought to you by the Five Star Co-host, an Airbnb management and consulting company that helps homeowners turn their properties into passive income streams through short-term rentals. Do you want to turn your vacation house into a passive income stream? Then look no further. The Five Star Co-host has served over a thousand guests in several Airbnb properties and in varying markets. The STR Co-host or the Five Star Co-host is at the vanguard of the short-term rental industry by leveraging technology and systems to maximize the guest experience while achieving high revenue for owners. Get a free home analysis by emailing the five star co-host at gmail.com. That's the five star co-host at gmail.com. T-H-E-F-I-V-E-S-T-A-R-C-O-H-O-S-T at gmail.com.